Welcome back to our study over the book of Hebrews. I'm glad to have had you joining us throughout this summer, and I know we've covered a lot of ground, a lot of depth. One of the things we've been saying is how important it is while reading the book of Hebrews to have the Old Testament in one hand while you have the book in the other. And that goes just be, that goes beyond even having the Old Testament, but it's important to have uh, ancient philosophy and theology and and understand the practices of the early church in order to be able to apply this book, the theology, the teachings on the Christian faith and application, to our circumstance today. Last week we talked about a very important word, uh, a word, hypostasis, which that word basically just means reality, um, but it also it, it goes beyond reality. It means reality, but it means substance and essence, which kind of signifies not just experiential reality, but concrete. So the word hypostasis is this word that means a concrete reality that goes beyond our experience in temporal living. So when I say temporal, I mean just a life that has a start point and an end point. The teachers of the Old Testament, the, the first century Christians, they understood that there was this reality that was eternal, that didn't have a start or end that that was where true faith came from. This reality is concrete. It's concrete, and it's eternal. And this faith, this concrete eternal faith, bleeds into, and the, and the heroes of the faith, it bleeds into their experience. It's, it bleeds into their experience, or their temporal, their finite faith, or life. So, the point in bringing that up is that those who go before us in the Old Testament, they, they experienced the concrete. They experienced the, the hypostasis. They had an understanding of this eternal faith that bled into their experience, bled into the way they lived their life. But they never inherited the promise, the eternal promise of the dwelling place with God, because that promise only comes through Jesus. And so, building off that, we've said throughout this study how important the word therefore, that we have to look at what therefore is therefore. And so here it's to say that we have a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, that we have an example of what it means to experience and live out a faith that is based in concrete reality, based in eternal truth. So then, based on that witness, let us, and, and these words, let us, they think of them as application words. Because of this, we need to do this. So there is a qualifier that goes before it. So because we have a cloud of witnesses, because we have those who set an example, let us lay aside every hindrance, lay aside the sin that's ensnares, let us run with endurance, and let us keep our eyes on Jesus. We should, like those before us, as we experience this life, as we attach ourselves to concrete reality and truth, we should lay aside the hindrances of the experience we have. We should lay aside the sin. We should focus on living righteously just as the truth of God's concrete reality dictates. We should endure the hardships. We should keep our eyes on Jesus because he's the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. So that word pioneer gets into this meaning of he is the, the first fruit or the firstborn, which you often hear, that's a, a word that is used throughout Scripture and, and used by the, the author of Hebrews. And it signifies not that Jesus was created first or that he was um, formed. Jesus is eternal, but he is the pioneer in the sense that he is the first to take this concrete reality, turn it into an eternal experience. So those who came before us, they took the concrete reality and made it a temporal experience in the sense that they still died. They didn't inherit the promise. Jesus is the pioneer that he takes the eternal hypostasis and makes it an eternal experience that forevermore 
we come into the throne room of God. So he's the perfecter of our faith as well. He's the pioneer. He's the perfecter. It's, he's the example that is set in how to live out this life in connection to the concrete. But he is also the way that we do it. That because of his work on the cross, because of his atoning sacrifice, we now have the spirit indwelling us that we can have this type of endurance. And we can follow his, his example in that the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross. That we too can keep that joy before us, the concrete reality, keep it before us, endure the suffering, despise the shame we experience, and know that eventually we will sit down at the throne of God. So Jesus takes this concrete reality, and that concrete reality in the experience becomes the experience. It wells up into the experience. It is no longer just simply something that bleeds into our experience, that we live a different way because we have faith in this concrete, but the concrete becomes what we experience. And maybe, it, well, it, it won't become our experience in this life, in this earth, on this earth, but we're promised that it will eternally be our experience because he's our perfecter. That's what the author of Hebrews is getting here by saying Jesus is the ultimate hero of the faith. He's the pioneer. He's the perfecter of our faith. Now, this then moves into what it means to go through hardship. That hardship and suffering, it's not, it's, it's not something that God causes, per se, but it's something that brings benefit. So the, the teacher in Hebrews, he quotes a passage in Proverbs, which is Proverbs 11, or Proverbs 3, 11 through 12. And he quotes it here in, in Hebrews 12, 5 through 6. And it says, My son, do not take the Lord's discipline lightly, or lose heart when you are reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and punishes every son he receives. Now, the point of this is not to say that God is causing evil and suffering upon us, but he's also not taking it away from us. He's using it so that we grow. And we can't simply think of punishment in the terms of, I, I messed up and now God is punishing me because of this one mistake I made. All humanity, all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. We're receiving of punishment. We are um, we are we should receive some sort of punishment. So we can't necessarily think of it as I messed up in this one specific circumstance, and because of this one specific circumstances, this is the punishment that I'm receiving. That's not how it works. We just simply experience God's discipline as his people because he's helping us grow in that reality. Think, for example, of of Job. Um, if you know anything about Job from the Old Testament, Job was someone who had faith in this unseen reality. And that unseen reality, it bled into the way that he lived out his life. But then Job suffers. And we see early on in the book of Job that he was suffering at the hands of the adversary of God, but under the permission of God. That God used this adversary to uh, the suffering that this adversary brought to solidify Job's faith. And so Job's faith in the concrete reality, it grew and grew. Because by the end of the book, we see that Job had a deeper understanding and appreciation for God than he did at the beginning of the book. Job, God uses the suffering to deepen our understanding of the concrete and make it so that that concrete becomes closer and closer to our experience in the finite, in the temporal. That's the point of hardship and suffering. And, and the author of Hebrews says, No discipline seems enjoyable at the time, but painful, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. He's identifying the fact that the more we go through this life experiencing hardship, the better and more appreciative we are of the concrete reality provided through Jesus. And St. John of the Cross says it this way, that when we come to Christ, we essentially are given this bottle of nutrients. That's my picture of a bottle. It's not a very good bottle. Sorry about that. But we're given this bottle like an infant would receive milk. And everything is good. We, we're satisfied in this milk. It's enough. It sustains us. 
but eventually that bottle has to be taken away. Why? Because just like an infant has to learn to eat on solid food, we have to learn to take this concrete reality of our faith into our life. And that means we have to learn how to eat. So even though we've been experiencing this spiritual high of having the bottle, it gets yanked away and it feels like a spiritual low. But then we get used to eating and we get used to walking through life. And then something might happen and we'll feel this desolation. All these low points are desolations, points where we feel as if God has abandoned us. But in reality, we realize he, was, he never did. And all the while, we're continually growing and growing so that where we started as a Christian, as a believer, is never where we end up. But when we get to these low points, we feel like God has abandoned us. He hasn't. But through our hardship, through our suffering, through what the author of Hebrews identifies as discipline, we learn. And this concrete experience bleeds more and more and more. This concrete reality bleeds more and more and more into our experience of God in this life. So that we're growing more and more in Him. Which is a, eventually going to fully be true where... In reality, our experience, our, our, the concrete reality of God's eternal presence becomes our eternal experience. And that's what we're living for. That is what we're hoping for. That is the promise we're, we're striving towards. And we grow in as we go through a life filled with hardship and suffering. We're longing to get to this point where we come to Mount Zion. So Mount Zion, the author of Hebrews alludes to here. Mount Zion is a picture of the presence <coughs> is a picture of the presence of God. It's a picture of the dwelling place of God. The Israelites would come to Mount Sinai or came to Mount Sinai coming out of Egypt, and that was where God gave Moses the Ten Commandments, where he revealed himself to Israel. But Israel couldn't ever really seem to attach themselves to God. It's through Jesus, though, that we come to Mount Zion with the presence of God within us, with the Spirit indwelling us. We not only come into the presence of God, we become the city of the living God. We become the kingdom of God. We are united together as those who are indwelled with the Spirit to be God's people because of Jesus, who is the mediator of a new covenant. That through him, we now experience eternally what it means to be in the presence of God. We experience that in eternity, but we get to start experiencing it now. And that's where we have this already aspect of what it means to be God's people. We are already God's people. We are already beginning to have this, this hoopostasis start to well up inside of us to the point that it's affecting our experience. We live differently today as God's people, than we would have if Christ had not come. We are beginning to have this concrete reality bleed into our experience reality, but eventually, in the not yet, all we will experience is this concrete. All we will experience is that concrete reality here. That is what we long for. That is what we hope for, and it's all because of Jesus, who is the mediator of this new covenant. That's the teaching that the, the, the teacher of Hebrews is bringing us into, that therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, we should remain thankful, serve God acceptably, with reverence in all, while we're in this life. The, the way that we live this life, even amidst suffering and hardship, should be one of thanks, because we know that this concrete reality is becoming experiential reality. We should serve God humbly and lovingly with reverence and awe because we know that the concrete reality is coming. And we're already starting to experience it as God's people, as God's church. But eternally, we will be in His presence. There will be no more suffering. There will be no more heartache. We'll only be with Him. And I'd like to just close with this, this thought from the Gospels where you have this picture of the criminal that's hanging on the cross next to Jesus. And this criminal looks over at Jesus, and he has this realization of that he is the Son of God, that he is holy, that he is different. So why does he have this experience? Why does he have this realization? How is he able to look at Jesus suffering in agony and know 
He's not like us. It's because he witnessed that Jesus was experiencing the same finite hardship and agony that he was. And yet, he experienced it differently. Because he had a concrete reality that had welled up inside him to the point that his finite and temporal reality, it overtook it. That's who Jesus, Jesus experienced that because he's God. And you might say, well, I'm not God. I can't have my experience be overtaken by this concrete eternal reality. Except the Spirit is at work within you. And He wants to overflow you with the character of God. Now, that doesn't mean we become God. It doesn't mean that we no longer have suffering. But it means that in the midst of suffering and hardship, in the midst of financial crises, in the midst of sickness, and in the midst of mourning and loss, we can say that we're blessed, as Jesus says in the Beatitudes, because we're attached to this concrete reality that we long for. We're attached to this promise that we know is coming. Because Jesus has made that way as our high priest and mediator of the new covenant that resides within our hearts. And I hope that awareness, I hope knowing that it transforms your faith to make it something even more beautiful than it already is. That you appreciate, you have awe and reverence and serve humbly the God who gave his life for us. So we can forevermore fully experience his concrete eternal reality with him in his presence. If you, ha if you haven't already, make sure to read through Hebrews 12, 1 through 29. Look at that proverb in Proverbs 3, 11 through 12. And you can even look at Exodus chapter 19 and have some insight into to what Israel went through and, and approaching the the mountain of God and how they couldn't fully experience him yet. So you have a deeper appreciation for what we experience, the concrete reality that's already bleeding into our life through the work of Jesus. I hope you've enjoyed the study as we've dug deeply into the book of Hebrews over the course of the last nine weeks. We have one more week remaining, and we'll be looking at Hebrews chapter 13, verses 1 through 21. And I look forward to digging into that with you next week our last session of the study. We'll see you then.